afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I can say quite honestly, it's a pleasure for me always to be here. I always, when I come back here, it's like coming back home. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you. I hope I won't talk too much. And a lot of you probably know as much or more than, than I about this battle. But uh, I, I want to tell you, if I can, some uh, personal things and also some uh, matters of strategy and tactics. Because, as you know, uh, we lost this battle. And there are many reasons for it. And one of the main reasons was the planning of, for the operation. And as an excuse, it, uh, it was done in under seven days. For instance, the planning for the D-Day operations took six months. And still some things went wrong on the day. And if you imagine the whole of this operation, over 2,000 transport aircraft and gliders, 1,000 escort fighters, etc., uh, coming from 22 airfields in Britain, uh, was laid on in six days. Now, it probably takes a month or more to lay on an, uh, an exercise of one aircraft. Uh, and during that planning, many errors were made which led to the failure of the operation uh, at this end, partly due to the, as I say, the hurry, partly due to an argument that the Army has with the Air Force, that the, in an airborne operation, the Air Force has the upper hand in planning until the troops land on the ground. And it was the, an Air Force decision First of all, we would only have one lift per day. The aircraft would come in by day and not by night, which is the best time for parachutists to land. One of the reasons for flying in by day was that the American Air Force, due to its hurried uh, <coughs> enlargement, didn't have enough navigators, only one per three aircraft. Uh, the other reason, uh, coming in by day, they had to fly in close formation to provide, uh, so they could be escorted by fighters. And as I told you, we had nine, 900 fighters as escort for the two American divisions and ourselves, and very effective they were. So. Here we were on the first day, as you know, the first parachute brigade, first glider brigade landed near Wolfhäuser. Uh, the first parachute brigade set off towards Arnhem Bridge, and as you know, only the second battalion got there. The task for the air landing brigade was to defend the landing areas for the second lift on the next day which was uh, the rest of the gliders and the 4th Parachute Brigade. The King's own Scottish borderers were responsible for defending this dropping zone. And as soon as they rendezvoused uh, near, near Wolfhäuser, they set off uh, to, uh, into their positions. And briefly, they were one company in the far corner, right down there with battalion headquarters. One company right across there over, over the sheep, and one company right down in the corner there. Now, the King's Own Scottish border has made a fatal mistake. Nobody was here. And as you see, it's a bit of ground which dominates the landing area. Why, I don't know. They had a company about half a mile down the road up which we came. So, uh, that was their position. They, uh, they got into position. And during the late evening, 
night, uh, so many enemy troops started to come in from the west and engage the King's Own Scottish borderer in, in that position. And during the night, more came in and they occupied this hill here and the cafe and buildings behind. And somehow, a platoon of the King's Own Scottish borderers went to sleep, were captured from a hutted camp down there. What they were doing, it looked as if they were fast asleep. <laughs> but anyway, uh, during the day, the, the enemy came in and there were patrol actions fought all the way around the troughing zone. Uh, we were due to come in at 11 o'clock the next day. And the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Pathfinders, uh, laid out their markers down on the new motorway, ready for our arrival. But instead of us arriving, about 30 enemy fighters patrolled the area of this dropping zone and the landing zone is uh, at Wolf, near Wolfhazer. Uh, it was a good thing that due to the mist in England, no aircraft could take off. And we were delayed four hours. And by the time we came in at three o'clock, the enemy fighters had uh, log run out of fuel and returned to Germany. And there was no information with base, so the King's Own Scottish borderers waited and thought, what in the hell's going on? And with the King's Own Scottish borderers were the advance parties of each battalion. That is an officer and about 20 men. And their job was to mark the rendezvous of the various parachute battalions uh, after they landed with coloured smoke. For instance, the 10th Battalion, this was their rendezvous, and it was green smoke for them. Blue smoke for brigade headquarters just down the track, and red smoke across there for 156. So they waited and waited uh, for our arrival. And at about 3 o'clock, they heard to the south uh, uh, a lot of noise of enemy flap or enemy aircraft, anti-aircraft fire, because the Luftwaffe had information about our arrival from a, the orders were captured on the body of an American officer from a crashed glider. So they knew the line of flight and the time of arrival. And that is why the enemy fighters were here and they lined up the their flak south of the Mars and south of the Rhine. So, uh, as I, as we flew in, uh, we bent uh, this anti-aircraft fire. Uh, our brigade took off from Leicestershire in England, from two airfields in uh, 127 Dakotas. They took some time to formate to get into these big formations of 36 aircraft called a serial flying, flying in very close formation practically wingtip to wingtip um, and we flew across the english channel and right across uh, not the english channel the north sea and there was a, a line of air sea rescue launches uh, and uh, i could see already they were rescuing the uh, soldiers from a glider that had landed in the sea. Uh, we crossed the Dutch coast and we met the first bit of flak. We flew over the flooded parts of northern Holland for about five minutes and standing in the door I could see the um, farmer and his family, family in several houses all congregated on the roofs of their farm surrounded by water but they were still waving at me and I could wave back to them from my door in the aircraft. But then as we approach, and uh, I'm sorry for my uh, bad Dutch, 
near a place called Herzogenbosch. Is that all right? <laughs> uh, in German, we Herzog. met the first flag. The aircraft came down from 1,500 feet down to about 700 feet and closed up into their drop formation. And when you are in that close formation, the aircraft, there's a lot of aircraft wash, and it, uh, it, it, it's uh, very difficult to stand up in, in the aircraft. But we lost, the brigade lost five, five aircraft shot down in the last 15 minutes of the flight. <laughs> One of the, it was an aircraft immediately to starboard a vine got a direct hit and as I was standing in the door it passed under the door uh, a blaze from wingtip to wingtip and I watched it crashed uh, in a great ball of white flame. All 19 parachutists and six crew were killed. Of the other four aircraft most of the uh, parachutists were able to bail out before it crashed. But I must give the American pilots uh, due value because although they were young, inexperienced, and despite flying through this flak and seeing the aircraft shot down, as they got, approached the DZ, they maintained their steady flight and formation. ago when we used to talk to the students of our army staff college here uh, this was nicknamed by the commandant chaos corner and uh, I will explain why he called it chaos corner now you were looking down onto what uh, in 44 was LZL and in those days there were not the trees that you see it's a perfectly good landing zone for gliders and parachutes. And as I said right at the beginning, the 4th Parachute Brigade, whose job was to get to the north east of Arnhem, uh, this could have been the dropping zone, and we'd have been halfway there. But this in the plan was the landing zone for the gliders bringing in the Polish anti-tank guns and vehicles. Only. Now, as I explained um, down at the tunnel, 156 Battalion with the rest of the brigade behind advanced along the railway uh, in, in the dark. And as the leading company um, got to about the position behind you on the railway and uh, runs into a cutting, they were ambushed by the German defenders and they lost the uh, leading section. By which time the, our brigadier had come back from uh, divisional headquarters at the Hartenstein and uh, ordered a halt and given out the, the orders for the next day as I explained, which was for 156 to continue up in this direction to capture Lichtenbeet, press on to the outskirts of Arnhem. The 10th Battalion were to advance across the open ground behind me and to take up a position on the main Amsterdam road at the Leer and Doodle. And uh, we would then hopefully press on. 
Now, the new orders were given out to us uh, along the railway, <coughs> but, <coughs> sorry, 500 yards uh, behind us. And the orders were that, first of all, C Company would push through this wood here behind you uh, to a point 56.5 marked on the map, a little raised area, and that would be the first bound. Now, here was another mistake made by <coughs> our battalion commander, who was a very good soldier indeed, but because he was pressed by the brigadier to get on and get on into Arnhem, some of the normal procedures of battle were skipped in that no reconnaissance was carried out by us to see what was the other side of this wood. So duly at first light C Company set off and came through the wood here. There was these trees were not here in those days. And our battalion mortars in position and we had a battery of 75mm guns in support. So C Company came through here and up through the woods and took up a position quite easily on 0.56 uh, near the Trenchevay. It was the job of my company give, to give them supporting fire from the other side uh, of the railway. And I moved up over the railway uh, and uh, along the row of houses until I reached the, the bridge over the railway and I could fire onto the German positions. And incidentally, as we went up there, I went through a house right at the end there to set up the firing position from the roof and there was a dear old couple having breakfast in their kitchen. And uh, we were able to give them fire support and to fire on quite a number of uh, Germans who came down to Dwayne to the railway bridge. Sadly, when I came down from the attic, there was a bloody great hole through the kitchen, and I think the their old couple had disappeared into the cellar, where they must have remained for the rest of the battle, because those houses, the other side of the railway, were right in between uh, two to the, uh, uh, us and the enemy for about six days. Anyway, I was told that having done that, I would come back along the railway, uh, come into where we are now, come up this track here, and battalion headquarters was about a quarter of a mile up the track in the woods, where there used to be a water tower, and there's now a statue, I think, of the Virgin Mary. Um, and I was told to report to the commanding officer, um, by which time our A Company had been launched uh, in an attack to cross the Dreyenschevig and to get up onto the Lichtenbeek feature. I arrived up uh, after that had happened and the, our brigadier had been seeing our colonel and he'd obviously uh, impressed upon him, you must get on at all costs. And therefore, this is why there's one of the reasons uh, some of the essential points of tactics were missed. Now, A Company put in an attack on, on the Dreyenschevig to get through, and they were slaughtered. And all the way along the Dreyenschevig were the, about a force of about 500 of the Panzer SS divisions with about 20, 25 armoured vehicles. There's armoured vehicles, armoured cars, half tracks, and the most deadly weapon was a, on a half track, a 20 millimeter flat gun. And firing into these trees here, the 20 millimeter shells burst and the splinters go in all directions. And if you're walking, lying down, you'll get hit. Anyway, the colonel said to me, uh, a company have gone through, so he said. He said, you must cross the road and get on to Lichtenbeet and push on to the next feature. 
and for some unknown reason he said to me, there are only some snipers around. He must have heard the racket going on of A Company. Now, sadly again, why he didn't do it, he was very good at using supporting fire during our battles in Italy. I said we had the mortars here, we had a battery of guns. Now, no fire support was given to A Company. If a head of A Company attack, the artillery and the mortars had fired on the road, and as you know, the shells and the mortar bombs burst in the trees, and the splinters come down, there, no, there could have been no Germans in the slip trenches or in the open half tracks. Anyway, as I said, press on regardless. I formed up my leading platoons and we pressed on, hopefully, to get on across the road to join A Company. But as I advanced up the track, there were bodies uh, lying down on either side. Uh, one of these tracked vehicles uh, that we had was bringing back the casualties on stretchers. And I got within about 100 yards of the road and beside the road on a pile of logs was a whole of a platoon headquarters who had been killed. We, there was an open clearing there and I hesitated for a bit before crossing and I was, uh, our major in charge of the support company came up with me um, and we heard the noise of low flying aircraft. So he said, Spitfires, let's get across. <laughs> he looked up, there was a fighter with a bloody great red black cross on it. And they were strafing us up down in the, in, in the wood. And as I explained last time I came here, foolishly, I made a mistake that looking back on it is probably natural at the time. Right ahead of me <coughs> up the track was one of these twin barrel 20 millimeters that was causing the trouble. And I went forward with three or four of my, my men to try and knock it out. And we got within 10 yards of it. And as one of my men was about to throw a phosphorus grenade onto the half track, he was shot. And what I didn't realize, there was a bloody little crack up the tree above. And he shot me. And eventually, I was rescued by one of my soldiers and brought back to the regimental aid post, which was uh, by the water tower in the middle. The, and that both with A and B companies, more or less at half strength, we had enormous casualties there. There was no way of getting across. Uh, the rest of the battalion tried to make one or two more attacks, but without success. The opposition was too strong. Okay. Now, by this stage, the 10th Battalion were up on the main road, just short of the Lerendu, total, having the same sort of battle. And the General Urquhart that morning had escaped from the attic that he was hiding in down by St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And again, doing what he did when he was caught behind, driving a jeep on his own. He drove through the woods and came up to our brigadier at his headquarters just down here on the railway. And they discussed the situation. And the situation was that the 4th Brigade were being boxed in. We had a strong force in front of us. There were two or three enemy battalions all the way along there and there was an enemy a battalion approaching the level crossing at Wolfhazer. So it looked as if the brigade would be boxed in north of the railway. And what our brigadier wanted to do was to get in with the rest of the division uh, wherever it was. So orders were issued to withdraw the brigade. Now, withdrawals in battle are usually done at night, so the enemy don't know what is happening. But withdrawing 
by day, in daylight and in action, close action with the enemy, is one of the most difficult uh, tactics in, in warfare, and that is what we had to do, or it's what the battalion had to do. And the orders were issued, be prepared to withdraw. And then uh, there's some information came through which forced that the order to be given, withdraw at once. So one, the remnants of 156 had to start withdrawing out of these woods, followed up closely by the German armour and infantry. The 10th Battalion started to withdraw across the open ground, heading for the level crossing. And just as they got into the middle of it, the gliders came in. And there were about 37 gliders which <laughs> took off from England, most of them with the Polish guns and, and jeeps. Some were gliders that had uh, cast off on the first day, coming in again. About a dozen cast off or were shot down, coming in. The remaining gliders came in, escorted by the Luftwaffe, who were shooting up the gliders from the air. Now, the KOSB were again meant to defend this landing zone. They had their headquarters in Johanna Herver farm just below us, or what used to be the farm, and the companies were all the way around the landing zone and in contact with, with the enemy. So w when the Polish gliders came in, came in the, they met the, re the re withdrawing 10th Battalion coming across in the middle. The uh, Germans on the far side shot at the gliders and there were battles with the King's Own Scottish borders. The, the jeeps, the, sorry, the, the poles who got out of the gliders which did crash didn't know what was happening. There were Germans, there were British, they fired at everybody. There was bloody chaos down there. There was a German armoured car driving around, shooting into the gliders to shoot them up. Our own medical officer came out from his regimental aid, uh, aid post up here in a carrier and he uh, drove around to the gliders to try and get some of the casualties out. And as you do, the Poles didn't know who was British, they didn't speak English, and we didn't speak Polish. So there was utter chaos. And the 10th Battalion lost half their men coming across the landing zone, hotly pursued by the enemy. <laughs> and, um, so, the 156 came back down this track and across here, making for the railway uh, in some haste. And the German armour came through the woods and could fire on them from here. And they got down along the railway, and about halfway along, as I said before, an order was passed uh, to the level crossing is held across the railway. And as I said before, that order did not reach half a 10th battalion or half of 156 battalion. So half got over the, the railway, half went to Balfesa. So that night, the other side of the railway, the, what was left of the brigade concentrated about 270 men of 156, 10 battalion, and about 80 or 100 of brigade in quarters, the engineer squadron, <coughs> and the field ambulance. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I left you at the last stand with the brigade withdrawing back down along the railway or over the railway. Half of them, if you remember, going on to the level crossing where they all got mopped up during the next two days. So half the brigade got over the railway and uh, concentrated by battalions and units just this side of the railway. And as I said, the brigadier wanted to move through these woods here at night to get into Oosterbeck to join the rest of the division, but that was refused. So the next morning, the very early next morning, the, what was left of the brigade set off to move through these uh, Wolfhazer woods. And they started off 
coming up a long track, which I, I think most of you will know, called the Breeder Line. And by that time, the Germans had moved in uh, practically on three sides, through the woods from this side, over the railway, and uh, over from the Wolfhäuser direction. So as the uh, brigade came up along the Breeder Line, they were attacked from both sides and they <coughs> sustained casualties coming up. The leading battalion, 156, got up very nearly toward the Breda Line, joined the Wolfwieserweg. But that was held by the enemy. And sadly, this is where the border regiment made two mistakes. First of all, they withdrew a company from the level crossing too soon. They did have a company down at the road junction where the Bredelan joins the Valfezu, uh, and they withdrew that too soon. But by the time 156 arrived, it was <coughs> held by the enemy, and they had um, a, a, quite a strong battle, uh, but failed to get through. So the Brigadier gave orders to change direction and come in this direction and the whole time they were being harried on all sides by infantry and by armoured cars, suffering casualties the whole time. Now, as you can appreciate, fighting in woods is difficult. And remember that we, there was more leaf on the trees then. You get fired on from the left, you send a party of men over to, to deal with them on the left, you get fired up from the right and say, go there, you, you lose touch with those men, you lose touch with those men, and then you press on in the centre. So you get involved in a series of small battles all the way up, uh, losing men, until eventually the 10th Battalion broke through and got through on the road behind you into the, what was forming uh, as a perimeter. 156 Brigade Headquarters were about 150 yards down there, surrounded by enemy infantry and armoured cars. And the last of the, the jeeps were, were destroyed there. So the Brigadier got hold of uh, Major Jeffrey Powell, one of our company commanders, and he brought him to a point about 50 yards through there. And these, this was qu quite open in those days. And he said to Geoffrey, and he pointed to what is called the hollow, where you see those young trees there. There was a, an open hollow there. And he said, you see, Geoffrey, that hollow, it's full of bosh. Now drive the buggers out, and occupied. And Geoffrey Powell got about 20 of his men and literally charged. And they charged screaming and yelling and the Germans fled. So he and the remnants of the brigade, about 250 men, got into the hollow. And there for the next four or five hours, they had to make a stand, surrounded on all sides by the enemy, sometimes being attacked by armoured cars, but mostly suffering casualties from snipers or from rifle fire. Until about five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they'd lost about half the strength. There were about 150 men left in the hollow. And the Brigadier collected some of the few surviving officers, and at the far end of the hollow, where it meets the, where it's almost on the road, well, when you pass it, you'll see a, a pillar, a marker post, as a memorial. And he got his remaining officers there, and he said, right, collect all the able men that you have that are left uh, in this corner of the hollow. And when I give the order, 
go, we will go out with one mad rush. He himself, our brigadier, went round the hollow and said goodbye to the wounded that had to be left. And of course, many did. And he came back and he gave the order, go, and in one wild rush, they crossed the road and up a track, which you can't see from here, and ran for about 150 yards. And then about 100 yards ahead of them, they met the neatly dug positions of the border regiment, with every man complete with his uniform equipment. The 4th Brigade, mostly carrying German weapons, just in smocks, and bloodstained with bandages. And the young captain went up to Geoffrey Powell and said, will you get your filthy shower out of my company area? <laughs> At any rate, he collected them, and <clears throat> Chan Hackett went down to the Hartenstein to HQ to report for orders. And the remnants of 10th Battalion and 156, they went down to the Hartenstein and then they were issued with new weapons and ammunition and given a few ration packs and told, you've got one hour's rest and you will occupy houses to the north of the main road, which where the battalion fought for another five days uh, until the end of the battle and the final withdrawal. And, uh, and only 35 men of the battalion were left to cross the river at, at the end. So here was uh, very gallant leadership by our brigade commander. Uh, he was always referred to by General Urquhart as a broken down cavalryman. But uh, <laughs> as an infantry soldier, fighting here, he, he was brilliant and very brave indeed. Our commanding officer and second in command were killed here about 200 yards to, to the left. Two, also two very fine soldiers. So, and so again for temporary measure, the hotels down at the crossroads, the Schoonard, <laughs> and the other one on the opposite side, which I can never pronounce, and the Tafelberg, were taken over temporarily as dressing stations by the uh, air landing field ambulance. And it was on the third day when the failure to get into Arnhem uh, failed, and the effort to get into Arnhem failed, and the remnants of three battalions fell back towards Oosterbeek Church. Uh, and then at the same time, as I told you, the 4th Brigade, the remnants came through the woods and down through the woods over the road there uh, and came to the here to get uh, more weapons and ammunition and a bit of food and rest. So what became known as the perimeter uh, formed here, uh, not by plan but because of the failure of the operations on either side. So when the general realizing that, he said, right, I will form a bridgehead here based on the ferry on the river, which was then working. And I will await the arrival of 30 Corps, who were then in Nijmegen. But as I pointed out, the fatal mistake of our Airborne Corps commander was not to capture Nijmegen Bridge on the first day. It was still held by the Germans. So here is what known as the perimeter formed, consisting of about 3,500 men only, of which less than half were infantry. The other members were Royal Artillery, who were done by the Oosterbeek Church, and fighting very well, and they were a magnificent lot of men. The rest were all arms and services 
of the division. And this was a point we made in airborne forces, and I hope they do in the rest of the army, that whatever arm or service you're in, uh, you are first and foremost a fighting soldier, and you should be trained as such. And this is what they all had to turn to here, to be infantrymen. So the perimeter was formed, and as you probably all know, it was very narrow. And from the Hartenstein here, you could see both the east, the west and the east side. The east side was down at the crossroads, and the west side was up by the roundabout. Very narrow indeed. 156 Battalion with some glider pilots and recce squadron took up a position about 200 yards north of this road, main road behind, and they were the northern part of the perimeter. Along the western side were the border regiment who were largely intact. So in the north were glider pilots, engineers, recce squadron, 156, glider pilots, 10th battalion, independent company, RESC, Royal Artillery, glider pilots, 11th battalion, and so on. Really what, uh, if you excuse me, what we call the bugger's muddle of a defense. And there, they had to fight. And there was no, it was not a coordinated line. It was a series of, strong, of small strong points, either in houses or in slit trenches, as it was mainly on the western side. And the battle went on here for five days. And gradually, the casualties got higher and higher, from rifle fire, from snipers, but mainly from mortar fire and from artillery fire. And by the end of the battle, the Germans had about 110 artillery pieces firing into this area, in addition to the mortars. One of the most feared weapons they had was called the naval vessel, which is a six-barreled mortar, and it fired in succession. And you could hear it firing in the distance, going pong, 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 like that, and everyone knew that six large mortar bombs would come screaming in here. A lot of the casualties were formed by mortar bombs bursting in the trees and the splinters coming down into the open slit trenches. So overhead cover had to be provided. There were about 250 German prisoners in the tennis courts at the back there. Now, General Urquhart has been criticized uh, for going off on his own and with Brigadier Lathbury being cut off from command of the division uh, at a critical point. And that was difficult. He never said afterwards, after the war, what, he would, what decisions he would have made if he had been here the whole time. Uh, it is difficult. But anyway, by the time he came back, as I said, he realized, right, we must stand here. And I must say, and everyone says that it was his strength of courage, it was his leadership, which was partly due to this defense holding for five days. And as Brigadier Hackett called him that indomitable fighting Scot. And uh, he, we, those who got across owe much to him. And gradually, the, the, as I said, the casualties mounted till there were only about two and a half thousand men left. There was very little food. The casualties were mounting all the way around and the dressing stations were on the perimeter. Uh, Schoenhorn was occupied by the enemy, finally. The Tafelberg was occupied by the enemy. The casualties in there were either being killed or wounded uh, again. And it was on the one last day that uh, a truce was arranged by our head doctor, Graham Warwick, a very fine man, and not, as you 
you may have seen it in the film, A Bridge Too Far. Anyway, a two-hour truce was uh, arranged and quite a number of the walking wounded were taken from school north. Uh, that's all. And then, on that day, General Oak had passed the message over to um, uh, th 30 Corps. They were in communication then, more or less saying that uh, those that are left are end of their tether. There is no food, there is no ammunition. Any serious attack by the enemy will break through. We must be relieved in 24 hours. And that was when, or about the same time, that the generals on the other side of the river decided that the remnants must be withdrawn. There was no longer any hope of getting across the river. And the plan was drawn up on the other side of the river. It was brought over by General, by Colonel of the Royal Engineers. And in the space of an hour, General Hackett in here, General, General Oakert here with his staff uh, organized the plan. And he had studied the previous battle during the First World War of withdrawal and he based his plan on that. And the plan was to, what he called the collapsing paper bag, to start withdrawing from the north, and all the units on either side would come in here and move down. Uh, there were two routes uh, laid out for the withdrawal, starting off at two rendezvous points. One rendezvous point was just behind you, the other one was just the other side of the Hartenstein. And from these rendezvous points, the engineers laid white minefield tape, and they were policed by the one was just the other side of the Hartenstein. And from these rendezvous points, the engineers laid white minefield tape, and they were Police by glider pilots all the way down. So as it got dark, the first troops to withdraw were from the north, which was the remnants of 156 battalion, about 35 strong. By that time, they had been forced back into a house just across the main road, where Geoffrey Powell, one of our company commanders, formed them up, and much to the annoyance of the men initially, he ordered them to shave. He said, if you have a shave, you've got, we've got a long, hard night in front of us. You'll be better for it. And anyway, at the time given, they came across the road to the rendezvous point here, picked up the glider pilot guide, and went on down. It was the troops on the other side, 43rd Division, they laid on a tremendous fire support all the way around the perimeter. So there was a hell of a noise going on and it was raining and that uh, that that, uh, that damped some of the noise of the withdrawal. It didn't go according to plan because quite, there were quite a lot of Germans in the woods behind here in the middle of the night <laughs> and there were small actions fought and although the men tried to keep close together, they broke up and, uh, and they made their way down to the river across the flat where they were met by the two squadrons, two companies of the Canadian engineers, two companies of the Royal Engineers. The Canadian engineers who had powered motorboats, they, they ferried back 80% of the survivors. And the other side, I think it was about two and a half thousand men finally got back over the river. And they were met at Riel by the 43rd Division, given a, a quick uh, a plate of stew, I think. They weren't given allowed any more because they hadn't eaten for about six or seven days and taken back to Nijmegen. 